the China Federation of Industrial Economics, Chairman uh, Xiong Meng. Please join us on the stage. Jeremy Waterman of the US Chamber of Commerce. George McIntodis of the um, uh, Las Vegas Sands. And all our partners, uh, including Greg Allen of the US China Business Council. Greg, please come join us on the stage. Uh, Zach Konain, again from Nevada. Victor Gao, the Vice President of the Center for China and Globalization. Borja Gonzalez, the Vice Dean of the Professor, uh, the Vice Dean of uh, IE University in Spain. And um, now it's a very um, traditional moment, ladies and gentlemen. For those who have been to the China meeting before, you will see what will happen. So it's now um, a virtual ribbon cutting. There's no ribbon here, so we'll show you how it goes. Okay, good. So basically, we will count one, two, three, or E or some, and we cut the ribbon. Right? Okay, so we do it. One more time. Okay. We got the scissors. Okay, so let's see. One, two, three, and cut it. Good, good, good. Here we are. My first one. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Victor Gao from China Center for China and Globalization. We are very happy to take part in this major conference on China. Horatius is a great event, and we are very proud of that. And I wish all the ladies and gentlemen here a very happy evening, and we look forward to all the exciting meetings tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you. DR, okay. Now that our virtual ribbon cutting is complete and people have a, a bit of food in their, in their bellies, um, it's time to turn back to our program and I have the very distinct pleasure uh, to provide a more formal introduction uh, for Nevada State Treasurer Zach Cornine. Conine, excuse me. Treasurer Conine entered office last year which was a particularly fruitful year in Nevada, uh, for Nevada, uh, US China, for Nevada China commercial engagement. Between 2015 and 2018, trade in goods between Nevada and China more than doubled to over 900 million. And in the same period, trade in services grew by nearly 50 million to nearly 950 million, consisting mostly of travel related services. Nevada's exports to China supported more than, support, supported more than 11,000 American jobs in 2017 alone. And as will be apparent to anyone familiar with Treasurer Conine's impressive career, he is very well positioned to help Nevada expand this large portfolio of commercial exchange with China even further in the years ahead. Originally from New York, Treasurer Conine graduated from the very distinguished with all due respect to UNLV, uh, uh, Cornell University School of Hotel Administration, and began his career working at the Golden Nugget in Las Vegas, where he eventually managed over 2,000 employees as director of operations. After guiding the gaming prosperity, the gaming property, excuse me, to new ownership, Treasurer Conine worked as an investment analyst at Capital Standard and then joined a major gaming company as its chief development officer. Prior to running for office, Treasurer Conine co-founded a consultancy dedicated to helping new businesses succeed, where he ushered numerous emerging startups from concept to reality in the gaming, technology, and hospitality industries. Very valuable experience for this Horasis conference. And since entering office last year, Treasury Conine has been a tireless advocate of Nevada's, for Nevada's economic interests, particularly services industries like the hospitality industry. He's also been a forceful advocate in the educational space, leading efforts to locate additional funding for scholarships for students seeking to attend colleges and universities here in Nevada. It's my great pleasure and honor to invite to the podium Nevada State Treasurer Zach Conine for his remarks.
that was an exceptionally kind introduction. Um, I should probably just leave it there. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, as was stated, my name is Zach Conine, and I have the honor of serving as Nevada's state treasurer. Broadly speaking, the treasurer serves many roles, uh, one of which is the chief investment officer for the state. That means I'm charged with investing all of the state dollars to create additional benefits for Nevadans, whether that's by creating jobs or by creating opportunities to make sure our children can succeed. I'm always looking for ways that we can move Nevada forward. And that's why I was so excited to come speak to you all, because you're all looking for ways to move your individual businesses and our countries forward. So let's talk a little bit about it. You know, before that, as was stated, I, I grew up in farm country, uh, really, really small town in upstate New York. Uh, my father, uh, excuse me, my mother was a school teacher. My grandfather was a butcher. Um, that's when being a butcher meant you started with a cow and ended up with a steak. <laughs> my family scrimped and saved so that I could attend Cornell and later law school and have a better opportunity than they had. My wife and I, we have three kids uh, under six, so if you see me run out of here, uh, that's why. Um, we're scrimping and saving to make sure that our families can have a better opportunity. And I think that's kind of why we all do, I expect, what we do, right? So that the generations behind us can find some sort of generational opportunity growth. That's certainly why I'm in this job. I expect that's why Governor Ricketts, and thank you so much for joining us from the great state of Nebraska, is here. If we could have a round of applause for Governor Ricketts. You know, that's why we're all here. They talked a little bit about what I did before I entered political life. We started a, a small company. We employ more than 1,000 people. And we're using those skills uh, to try to make Nevada a little bit better. But one of the things I learned in the private sector, and I expect you all know this, is the value of trust, the value of creating relationships between parties so that when there is a disagreement, when we do disagree, we can find common ground and work towards that solution. I think recently tensions between our nations uh, have damaged that trust a little bit. But I'm hopeful that meetings like this, conversations like the ones I'm having at my table, and I hope you're all having at yours, can move us a little bit closer to that goal of a unified planet. You know, these tensions harm working families the most, right? Our individuals, our employees uh, who don't have the same opportunities that they had before that. Let's Let's try to fix that. To illustrate the importance of these partnerships, I'd point to our primary industry, tourism, as an example. We're incredibly blessed to have a thriving tourism industry in Nevada. Uh, no surprise as you look around this room. I don't know if you've noticed on your way in, but there's a number of other people in town. Um, and they're all gambling and they're eating, and they're here in Nevada because we are welcoming, because they trust what we have here. A third of our residents rely on jobs created by the tourism economy, and naturally, if people stop coming to Nevada, or people stop coming to the United States, that will harm my citizens. Since 2004, the Nevada Commission on Tourism and the Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority have increased their efforts to reach international tourists, notably those visiting from China. As a result, the number of Chinese visitors to Nevada has increased every single year in the last 15. Of the 56 or so million visitors that came to Nevada last year, over 250,000 visited from China, which represents a 30% increase from the previous five years. Should we wish to continue this upward trend, visitors must feel welcome. Do you all feel welcome here at the Las Vegas Sands? Yeah. Okay, good. Now we need to take that a little bit outside this room. Our governments must set the example by prioritizing international relationships and recognize the benefits that come from mutual respect and trust. We know that visitors from China tend to stay here longer. They have higher discretionary budgets to spend while they're here. These visitors also bring with them invaluable customs and culture that are shared throughout our communities. The population, the Asian American population in Nevada is one of the highest growing populations and with that, are coming fantastic technologies, great ideas, and more jobs. Nevada must be ready and willing to recognize the benefits our Chinese visitors bring to our communities, but we must also be willing to confront those in both of our governments who stand in the way of successful partnerships. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the amazing work that our tourism partners and gaming properties, like the Venetian and the Palazzo, are doing across the state to provide first-class services. Nevada businesses have led the way in ensuring our visitors feel welcome and have all the comforts of home during their stay. 
in addition to our, this is this entire thing is a commercial for Nevada. I hope you're okay with that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just want to be real, real clear. Uh, in addition to our thriving tourism economy, one of our state's biggest economic drivers comes from the mining and mineral resources sector. Nevada's mining industry is one of the largest in the world, and we lead the United States in producing gold, silver, and mercury. In 2018, Nevada's mining companies produced $7.8 billion worth of revenue and were responsible for providing jobs to more than 14,000 Nevadas. However, over $510 million in Nevada exports have been impacted by new tariffs, with nearly half, or $246 million, affecting our copper and mineral reserves. These new tariffs have created challenges for all of our residents by threatening good-paying jobs, increasing the price of goods, and filling us all with a bit of a sense of uncertainty what the future holds. Green energy and the development of more sustainable technologies are also on the rise here in Nevada. Our state currently leads the nation in solar power potential and has installed more than 3,500 megawatts of solar power. I'm told that's quite a bit. Nevada homes and businesses that run off of solar are dependent on photovoltaic cells. It's more than 60% of which come from China. In 2018, a 30% tariff was levied against these imports. While Nevada remains committed to reducing our dependence on fossil fuels, our respective governments must work together to foster a renewed commitment to sustainability. There's a theme here. Tourism, mining, and renewable energy are just three examples of the many industries that are reliant on effective international relationships. States across the country are facing similar uncertainties with respect to their top industries. With so many workers reliant on the jobs and stronger communities created by a robust global economy, it's imperative that our governments be innovative and seek solutions to these issues we collectively face. You know, while our tourism and mining industries are always top of mind and illustrate the real impacts of rising tensions, Nevada's economy has also become increasingly diversified. In 2007, Nevada was badly affected by an economic downturn. Our unemployment rate skyrocketed. Families lost their homes. We were number one state in the country for foreclosure. Not a thing to be proud of. And dreams of economic prosperity and a better future seem to slip a little bit farther out of reach. Because of the challenges we faced during the last recession, we've been working tirelessly to diversify our economy through investing in sustainable industries like advanced manufacturing, data centers, and renewable energy. To date, Nevada has attracted world-class co uh, companies excuse me, like Tesla, Apple, and Google. In fact, the Tesla Gigafactory has employed more than 7,500 good-paying, uh, has provided more than 7,500 good-paying jobs to Nevadans while helping to push us in the forefront in, of the changing automobile industry. Nevada has also attracted new entertainment options, such as the Vegas Golden Knights. Any hockey fans in the room besides Andy? the Las Vegas Raiders NFL team, and very soon, I'm told, the Madison Square Garden Sphere, which will provide attendees a 360-degree immersive concert and event-going experience. Um, and by mentioning that, I'm hoping I get invited to the opening. Um, <laughs> Stun? Okay, good. The state is growing in unprecedented ways, and whether it be through the production of gaming equipment for casinos in Macau, or lithium-ion batteries that help power the record number of Teslas in China, Nevada remains ready and open for business, both at home and abroad. As a state, we're targeting development in new and emerging industries. The Nevada economy of the future provides the perfect opportunity for fostering long-standing international relationships and collaborating with innovative foreign investment. To get it done, we will look to you all as entrepreneurs and innovators, both in this room and all of your friends, tell them all about Nevada, to help us lead the way. To my family and I, Nevada has always represented a place where opportunity is endless. Not only is it a place where a handshake agreement still means something, but it's a place where everyone has an equal opportunity to succeed, even if they weren't born into wealth. We're now at a critical point where the decisions we and our colleagues make will help shape the global economy for the next generation. We'll have to decide whether our children will live in a world where global trade is constantly under threat based on what's politically expedient, whether the market is allowed to work on its own so that new industries can flourish. What I would ask all of you tonight is this. Instead of building up walls and operating within silos of distrust, let us instead commit to fostering a robust exchange of ideas and culture. It's only through this collaboration, cooperation, and through finding common ground that we'll be able to solve the larger challenges we face in the coming decades. Thank you all for being here tonight. 
for taking the time to explore new ideas, for challenging yourself to face hard conversations and even harder decisions, and for constantly working to serve the many and not just the few. It's my pleasure to stand alongside you as a representative from the great state of Nevada and say that despite the challenging political climates we all face, Nevada stands willing and open to cooperate and to seek new relationships with partners abroad. And given the incredible benefits that you all bring to the state, including your commitment to spend all of the money in your pocket and your bank accounts while you're here, <laughs> we will work especially hard to build mutual trust and respect with our friends from China. Okay, now we're gonna do this one more time. All right, I wanna make sure everybody's on the same page here. All right, okay, Nevada. Nevada. Hmm, got an ah from over here. One, just one more time, Nevada. It's okay, you got a couple of days. Keep practicing. Again, I'm treasurer Zach Conine, and I'm looking forward to working together to invest in building something a little bit bigger than ourselves so that we can create that opportunity we talked about and a more prosperous future for more, the more than seven billion people that call this planet home. Thank you so much. <laughs> Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me now introduce Chairman Xiongmen, who is the Chairman of the China Federation of Industrial Economics. Chairman Xiongmen is very well known in China. He's leading China's main and leading industry organization, helping Chinese companies to globalize, to go overseas, to invest, and to innovate. He's also helping the Chinese state-owned sector to transform, to increase productivity, and we see many of the Chinese leading companies, both from state-owned background and private companies here tonight. Chairman Xiongmeng is also spearheading China's One Belt, One Road initiative, connecting with many countries in the world and helping Chinese companies and Western companies to collaborate. And I should also mention, Chairman Xiongmeng, you've been very much involved in this Harasit China meeting, uh, the 15th edition, and it's really a reason to celebrate. So thank you so much, Chairman Xiongmeng, and please um, join me to welcome Chairman Xiongmeng.呃，非常赞同刚才财务长、财务长先生啊讲到的，两国工商界应该多加强交流与合作，别见那么多的围墙。尊敬的克里斯州长，尊敬的康年财务长，尊敬的郭德曼主席，尊敬的马克安东尼
增长到二零一八年的六千三百三十五亿美元，增长了二百五十三倍。二零一八年服务贸易额超过一千二百五十亿美元，双向投资累计超过了两千四百亿美元。中美经贸合作为两国带来了实实在在的利益，为世界经济的繁荣与稳定。做出了贡献。虽然中美两国在经贸方面存在一些困难，但从总体来看，两国在经贸领域的共同利益远远大于分歧。双方利益交融的互利共赢关系，不仅两国受益，而且汇聚全球。国与国之间的经贸合作，是市场塑造和推动的结果。只有经贸往来。才有可能创造利益。只有共同做大经贸规模，才可能实现更多共同利益。中美在经济上都面临一些结构性的挑战，需要加快自身经济结构的调整，从自身做起，从做大增量的基础上，共同改善贸易不平衡现象。中美两国应该加强在制造业。新兴产业、农业、基础设施建设、能源、知识产权保护和服务贸易等重点领域的合作，减少双方相互投资的障碍，增加彼此之间市场开放的广度和深度，推动行业间建立有效的、机制性、长远的合作平台，共同探索在。技术创新、市场拓展、产业升级等方面的合作，不断提升合作的水平。对，两国智库、工商协会等非营利组织应该积极的协作，为企业之间的合作交流搭建桥梁。非常高兴，我们和我们中国工业经济联合会和美国商会有着长期的多年的。友好的合作和往来，那么应该承担起促进沟通、消除误解、弥合分歧的作用。中国工业经济联合会在中国拥有一百八十多家全国工业行业协会和众多各行业的企业会员，涵盖了工业制造业几乎所有的领域，也覆盖到。中国的各个省、全区域，美国商会是全球最大的商业组织，在美国工商界极具影响力。我们多年的合作也深知美国商会在中美之间的重要作用。我们希望通过两个组织的通力合作，能够进一步增强两国企业间和产业领域的深度合作。共同为中美两国工商业的蓬勃发展做出新的贡献。女士们、先生们，当前全球化带来多极化，各国经济相互依存、相互依赖的全球生产链、供应链、价值链，把彼此的命运紧密的相连。正如本届会议的主题，中国和美国。寻求双赢合作伙伴关系这么一个命题，双边经贸合作是寻求优势互补，基础是根本利益，本质是互利共赢。明天第十五届环球中国商务会议就要正式开幕了，衷心的希望与会的嘉宾们在多达十五场的论坛中坦诚交流，各抒己见。从而探寻合作的机会，加强深度合作，为促进世界经济的繁荣和稳定贡献我们的智慧和力量。最后，预祝本次环球中国商务会议取得圆满成功。谢谢大家。
Mr. Uh, Executive Vice Chairman and Secretary General for those very thoughtful and timely remarks. Uh, it's my great pleasure now to introduce our next and, and final speaker this evening, uh, the 40th Governor of the great state of Nebraska, Governor Pete Ricketts. Uh, an Omaha native, uh, Governor Ricketts has a very distinguished career in business, working for Union Pacific and a small company uh, known as Ameritrade, um, for, uh, of which he became the president and COO. Uh, like our prior uh, speaker from the state of Nevada this evening, uh, after departing Ameritrade, Governor Ricketts founded a company that supports local entrepreneurs and startups, um, a, a very important theme of this Harassus uh, conference. Uh, since becoming governor, Governor Ricketts is, uh, uh, has worked tirelessly to put his strong business acumen and background to work for the people of Nebraska, thanks in part to the governor's leadership and his understanding of how government and business can work together to develop an economy. Nebraska has won the Governor's Cup for the most economic development projects per capita three years in a row. Equally, if not more important for the purposes of our dinner this evening, and our conference discussions tomorrow, Governor Ricketts has been a champion of U.S.-China commercial engagement since he entered office in 2015. The governor visited China during his first year on the job and quickly followed up on that visit in 2016 by leading a trade mission to China with 80 representatives from businesses, academia, and cultural exchange organizations. In 2016, under his leadership, the state established a sister state relationship with Shanxi Province, which led to a number of mutually beneficial follow-on projects in agriculture and educational exchange. A great state leader once said, running state government like a business may be new to some, but it is critical to building an environment that encourages job growth and attracts young people who are looking for a place to live, work, and raise a family. Actually, it was Governor Pete Ricketts who said that, as I see him smiling. And I think all business and government leaders uh, who are here this evening, as well as in both countries, whether in the United States or China, would very much agree with that very articulate mission statement. And so it's my great pleasure to welcome Governor Pete Ricketts to the podium for his remarks this evening. Well, thank you very much and good evening. It is a pleasure to be here to be able to help kick off the Parasis China meeting for this year and to talk about this important relationship between the United States and China. As the chairman said earlier, the world is changing and the world has always changed. And of course, China is changing. China is very much different today than it was 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. One of the things that may not be so obvious is that America is changing too. And let me take a step back to World War II. There was an important conference at a place called Bretton Woods. And at that conference, it was established by the nations that attended to create a post-war order. And in that post-war order, the United States decided to protect the freedom of seas for all nations and be the market of last resort for the world. Now, of course, the world right after World War II had been devastated by that war. And really, only the United States, as one of the developed nations, was left relatively unscathed by that conflict. Since then, of course, in the past 75 years, the rest of the world has caught back up, has developed, and has industrialized. Not the least of which, of course, is China, with the second biggest economy in the world. And the generation of people that created that policy here in the United States has either died or is so old that they're not a part of the policy making of this country anymore. And so that world order that was created after World War II, the reasons for it 
have been forgotten. And Americans are questioning what this order is about, what their role in it is. And this is not something that is new to the Trump administration. You may recall, if you were following the elections back in 2016, that both President Trump and then Hillary Clinton, his opponent, were really challenging the notions of what it meant to have the United States as part of that world trading order. And so what I think we see right now between the United States and China is not only a China that has come of age and is expected to follow the international norms, but a United States that is questioning how the United States will fit into that order of trade around the world. And so the United States and China are reforging that relationship. And that is where I think we all find ourselves right now in the world. And it is a long road, as the panel I'll be sitting on tomorrow talks about, reforging that relationship between the United States and China, which is important not only to the prosperity of both nations, but the world as well. And as a leader of a state, I, of course, don't make the decisions with regard to foreign policy that is done at the federal level. But states do play a vital role in subnational relationships. As was described earlier, I lead trade missions. I've been to China twice. In fact, I've, I've been all around the world to Japan, the European Union, Canada, Mexico, just got back from Vietnam. And the point of these relationships is, or the, these trade missions, is to expand those relationships, to be able to open up that exchange back and forth not only on issues such as trade, but also cultural exchanges as well. So for example, the University of Nebraska Medical Center has a number of relationships with institutions of higher education in China, like Changji Medical School in Shanghai, or Northwest Agricultural and Forestry Unit in the Shanxi province. We have a development farm in Yangling, which is a demonstration farm to show American agricultural technologies. There's a number of cultural exchanges going back and forth, as uh, Jeremy mentioned, with regard to our sister state relationship with Shanxi province. And so as a state leader, I think about how are we creating these opportunities for the people of my state? We have a strategy to grow Nebraska. And by that, I mean create more and better paying jobs for the people of my state. It involves four pillars of that strategy. We call them four pillars of prosperity. The first is to make sure we're developing our people, making sure they have the right skills, and connecting them to the jobs in our state. That second pillar of prosperity refers to running government more like a business, to make it more effective, more efficient, and more customer-oriented, to use the same things that you all use in your businesses, to be successful and applying them to state government. The third pillar of prosperity is to make sure we're good taxpayers of, or good stewards of the taxpayer dollars. And that by controlling our spending, we can provide tax relief to our citizens. And then that fourth pillar refers back to what I was talking about, which is making sure that I'm going out and promoting Nebraska to the rest of the world, letting them know what a great place we have to invest in our state that we have, or a great place that we have to invest in our state. Nebraska, for example, has been deemed the most fiscally responsible state in the country, according to the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. We're also the least indebted state, according to Moody's. Forbes says we have the second best regulatory environment of any state in the United States. We have the fifth lowest cost state to do business, according to CNBC, and the fifth best state overall for business, according to Forbes magazine. And that's what helped us win those three Governor's Cup that Jeremy was referring to earlier. And we go out and promote the things we have to offer in our state, since it's our central location. You can re reach 90% of the U.S. population 
in two days by truck. We have a great workforce. In fact, more Nebraskans participate in contributing to our economy than any other state in the country. And we have the highest or second highest workforce participation rate, which means that more Nebraskans work than in almost any other state. We have that great low cost of business. And we have what I think is uh, just a great opportunity for people to invest and create, to create those jobs, but be successful in their investments. We have hubs around biosciences. Our number one industry is agriculture. So we are, have great natural resources to provide to the bioscience industry. Companies like uh, Novozymes, a Danish company making enzymes, or Veramaris, which is a joint venture between a German and Dutch company making omega-3 fatty acids. Costco has started their first poultry processing facility in our state, investing $450 million. And of course, Costco has recently opened up its first store in China. We also have a hub around technology, data centers, companies like Facebook, Google, Yahoo, Fidelity, Travelers, all have created that hub of high-tech jobs in our state. We also have an advanced manufacturing sector. Companies like Kawasaki have had a relationship for over 40 years in our state. And all of this creates that environment where we seek that investment from other states. And I, of course, then go out and promote that. Now, I will admit that Warren Buffett has got much better name recognition in China than the state of Nebraska. <laughs> but we are working hard to change that. And it is through the efforts of the states to be able to open up those responsibilities or open up those relationships and to be able to establish those connections, whether we're talking about trading or culture, that we can ex expand the relationship to the benefit of both parties. And that is part of what my role as governor is, to help create those relationships. And so it's a privilege to be able to be here tonight and to be able to have the conversations tomorrow to talk about this changing relationship, the changing nature of the U.S.-China trading, cultural, every sort of interface that we have is changing. And it's through continued dialogue that we will, we will be able to navigate the changing nature of China, of the United States, and the world at large. So thank you all for being here tonight, and thank you for being at this conference, to continue the dialogue, to talk about how this relationship will continue to change in the future. It's important that we have this dialogue so that we can make sure that the world of the future as this even more prosperity than the world that we are leaving behind. Thank you all, and I look forward to our conversations tomorrow.